Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vesta Svensson, and I'm a master's candidate and student fellow at the MLA and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University. I have curated the four sessions of the Holocaust in Lithuania speaker series, and I will be interviewing Mr. Samuel Bach today. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the speaker series, which has been offered throughout the spring. It has delved into the vibrant world of Lithuanian Jewry before, during, and after the Holocaust. The program began in March, and both the March and April sessions are now available on the Fish Center's YouTube channel. We will continue on June 4th with Dr. Justin Cami, speaking with our program director, Dr. Shai Pilnik, about Abraham Sutskover and Young Vilna. We have been enormously privileged to put together this series with our partners at Lithuania, in Lithuania at Vilnius University who are joining us today. Today's conversation is a conversation with Samuel Bach, the resplendent and prolific artist, storyteller, and Holocaust survivor. Please send questions for the Q&A to my email address, which is in the chat. Firstly, I would like to thank Amo Fish for founding our center and for valuing Holocaust education. If you would like to check out the Fish Center's many incredible programs and courses, please go to our website. I would also like to thank our partners in Lithuania, Dr. Jurgita Verbikine and Dovila Triskavaita, who will tell us more about Mr. Bach shortly. The partnership has not only facilitated for these four sessions, but it has also offered an extensive course taught by thinkers in Lithuania and in the U.S., and I have personally gained enormously from the experience. Thank you to Brittany Hager and to Hodiah Blau for all of your hard work behind the scenes. I would also like to thank Elliot Mott of the Rumsheskis Market Town Museum Corporation, which has not only partnered with us on this speaker series, but which has facilitated for a student research exchange through which I will go to Lithuania next week to continue the Vilnius University Yeshiva University partnership. Finally, I would like to thank the director of the Fish Center, Dr. Shai Pilnik, for making this partnership happen and for his tireless advocacy for our students. Dr. Pilnik is traveling to Slovakia today with Mr. Fish. Now we will hear from Dovila Triskovaita, who will tell us more about Mr. Samuel Bach. Thank you, Vesta, very much for introduction. Uh, I am very honored to greet Mr. Samuel Bach from Vilnius, the city where uh, he was born and spent first years of his life. Unfortunately, the days at that time were not easy. Uh, as a young boy, he did manage to uh, survive the uh, Soviet occupation, which started in 1939, and soon after that, the Nazi invasion. He, his parents, grandparents, neighbors, and friends were forcibly inhabited in Vilna ghetto, uh, where he uh, met well-known Jewish writers uh, Shmerke Kaczerginski and Abram Suskiver, and who really uh, had a um, big influence on his life at that time. Uh, even in those years of darkness, uh, Samuel managed to open his first exhibition uh, uh, at Vilna Ghetto, being at the, uh, at the age of nine. Uh, during the war, uh, Samuel was forced to live in ghetto in a Benedictine convent uh, and for a period of time in a forced labor camp on Subachus Street. The film under the title Good Nazi uh, sensitively depicts the reality of the life uh, in this camp and the fate of its prisoners. The film appeared in 2018 and you are all warmly welcome to uh, see it. It is an uh, accident or maybe a miracle, uh, but Samuel uh, back managed to survive together with his mother uh, in the Vilna ghetto and uh, when it was liberated. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, unfortunately, the rest of his family uh, were murdered. And uh, after that time, the odyssey of Samuel Beck and his mother, Mitya, began. Um, he firstly went to live in Lodz in Poland, as he was the former citizen of uh, interwar Poland. Uh, but later on, he uh, landed in Landberg, uh, where he was uh, living in the uh, camp of displaced person, persons. 
Uh, however, this Odyssey was marked by uh, different colors and uh, was depicted in the in the paintings as Samuel was uh, attending classes in Munich. Later, uh, when he moved to Jerusalem, uh, he was uh, he was uh, studying there at Bezalel Art School, and finally continued his studies in Paris. Uh, in 1993, his uh, uh, life path turned to Boston, United States, uh, and it was only in 2001 when he uh, first time returned to Vilnius. But this return was marked by incredible boom of uh, Samuel's Bach's um, history uh, of his paintings. Uh, several exhibitions were open at that time at Vilna Gaon Jewish Museum and Lithuanian National uh, Gallery. Later, uh, the exhibition was opened also in Kaunas uh, Art Gallery. Uh, so uh, it really, uh, it was really a, a great pleasure for Lithuanian audience to know the uh, Samuel Bach uh, to get involved uh, in the study of his paintings. Uh, and by ending this short biographical sketch of Samuel Bach's life, I want to express the gratitude of Lithuanians for uh, an enormous and priceless gift. Uh, it's more than 120 paintings which Samuel Bach has donated to our country and to everybody who is living in it. Uh, these uh, paintings are available for the broader audience in the uh, museum uh, named under uh, his name, the Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius. And uh, despite the, that, that it's a very important uh, issue in Lithuanian cultural life, uh, it also inspired many educational activities in Vilnius. Uh, one of them you can really ex experience yourself by visiting a web page, uh, which is called an Art Creates a Tolerance. Uh, and there you can uh, look closer to the donated pictures, even if you are very far away from Vilnius and you can experience their uh, uh, ideas, the colorful paintings and uh, just inspire yourself and uh, interpret the pictures on your own way. Uh, the life uh, experience of Samuel Bach is also presented in a very sensitive and very touching exhibition called The Jewish Child uh, Talks About the Holocaust. It's really a very uh, touching and very important uh, exhibition and many school children uh, had already attended it from various parts of Lithuania, not only from Vilnius. So I'm very happy that you had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Samuel Bach. And uh, I think that I don't, I don't uh, want to waste more of our time. And I'm just giving a word to Vesta and Mr. Bach to continue this uh, conversation on his experience in life. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and morning. Thank you. Thank you for- Thank you, Dovide. Thank you. Mr. Bach, thank you for speaking with us today. It's a joy and an honor. I've had the delight of reading your memoir, and in the 500-page book, there isn't a single extraneous word. Your writing is much like your art, bursting with imagery, composed in vignettes. It's not linear or chronological, but it paints a gorgeous portrait of not only your Holocaust experience, but of moving sketches to the individuals of your world. It brought me to tears and to laughter. It's also a fascinating deep dive into your work, and I loved moving through your enormous catalog after having read the memoir. It was bittersweet to finish. I've shaped your, uh, our talk today around your book. So to begin, can you tell us about the Pincus, its origin in your world and how you came to eventually revisit it? How I became a painter, the question. Yes. Well, um, uh, I was told that I should not paint on the wallpaper nor on the furniture and that they will give me enough paper to paint on. I must have been then about three years of age. I started painting. I started painting, but I was not considering myself a painter. But then 
my grandmother sent uh, some of my um, drawings or, or so-called paintings that I did age, age three and four to her brother, who was a renowned um, intellectual in Berlin. And he sent back to the family an order don't bother this poor child with anything but art. Kunst, Kunst und Kunst, which means art, art and art must be his daily bread. So that in a kind of middle-class family in Vilna, instead of wanting to have a child, a, a, I don't know, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant or whatever, I was already the painter. So it was not anything that I have chosen by myself or started myself, but it was something that happened to me. And, um, and I was an obliging child. I was a good boy because I knew that I can manipulate the grown-ups much better if I'm smiling and I am nice. So I went on painting. This is what they expected from me. And of course, then art became part of who I am of what I need. Now, a, a day that I don't paint, I feel that I have not lived. And um, and there were not many, many days that I did not paint in them in the, in the 90 years that I have accumulated so far. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Can you tell us about the Pinkett and um, Ab Abraham Sutzkover's role in your life and how that shaped your, your work in the ghetto? Well, um, uh, the Pinkas itself is an ancient book that belonged to the Jewish community. It was a book uh, that belonged to the community of uh, Ohave Chesed. It was a philanthropic organization. And the book is packed with names of various donors, uh, uh, committees for well-doing and so on. All this is in Hebrew. All this was not very accessible to me then. It is now. Then the book was very interesting for me because it had many empty pages, pages in which I could paint. But Sutskiver and Kaczerginski gave me this book to draw in it with, of course, a much deeper insight into the, the whole situation. The thing was that if I live in it, some things of what I am doing, it remains a document. It remains something that will survive with time, even if I am not surviving. They gave me this book because they were collecting books for the um, Rosenberg administration. And uh, there are today books about their collecting of books. I don't have to go into that. It will also take too much time. But uh, it is sometimes impossible for me not to smile and sometimes even to laugh when I look at the individual images of that book, because they certainly give an idea of what was going on in my head. I was an avid reader at age eight and nine. I read already books for grown-ups. I love the short stories of Chekhov. And there are some figures and some uh, events in these drawings that are of that. I love the Greek mythology. There are some things about that. The um, drawings that I did in the ghetto do not represent the life in the ghetto, but they represent much more. Uh, there might be a few exceptions. Uh, they represent much more my escape in of imagination <laughs> in the ghetto. And how did the book end up coming back into your life later on? Long after well, the, the book was with me. The book was with me in the, the uh, Hakape camp that was after the liquidation of the ghetto. Um, uh, and uh, when I escaped from the liquidation, uh, from the, the from the, it was almost always the end of the time of this um, the existence of this labor camp. It was in March. Uh, and then uh, Vilnius was liberated next year in July. 
uh, we uh, I, the book remains with my with my father who remained in the camp. He allowed me to escape, and my mother was escaped as well, and we were given the gift of 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 life. Then later on, I was in Israel. Uh, it was in the six sixty, but it was before the uh, Yom Kippur War. I had a visit. I was in Israel for for a brief period, and I had an exhibition. I was visited by the director of the Lithuanian museums, and he told me, "Look, uh, I, I I I have seen." Uh, this book and then I looked up your name and I realized that you are the, the painter. So whenever you wish exhibit this book, we will be very happy to provide. And um, and then the uh, war uh, uh, happened, the war of six days. Uh, Russia interrupted all uh, uh, diplomatic relationship with Israel. And I realized that the book is gone from my life Forever, forever. And then later on, when Mira Van Doren was um, making a film on the Jews of um, Vilnius, a wonderful film that is called the, uh, And the World Was Ours or something like that, about the pre-war uh, cultural and social life of Vilnius Jews, I told her, look, if you are go to Vilnius, you will find the Pincas. She looked it there, she looked for it, it was gone. They didn't know where it was. And then it popped up. It popped up because it was in a museum that was called, uh, that was part of the Soviet occupation of Lithuania. And when the museum was closed, the, the, the book was, 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 was sleeping somewhere. And in, 50, in, in 2001, when I arrived, after 56 years of absence, for the first time in the Vilnius, I was received by the then director of museums or um, libraries. And she presented to me the book. I knew before that, immediately after the war, that among the uh, bodies covered by blood in the in the, in 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 the, the Hakape uh, uh, camp that the partisans have found in in forty four, they also found this book. Kaczerginski told me about it, but I didn't want to see it. I was afraid maybe it has stains of the blood of my father. I I, I don't know. I didn't want to see. It. But then uh, when I came to Vilnius uh, in a very elegant room on a beautiful table of the eighteenth century and so on, the book brought with white gloves. It was a very different story. And today you can see the book in the museum, in the museum of um, Samuelis Bacas <laughs> in Vilna. I'm very excited to visit it next week. So on this slide, in the YIVO archive, I found the ghetto meeting minutes discussing yeah. the selection of the artists for the ghetto art exhibition. And among them, I found S. Bach, nine years old. Can you right. tell us about the ghetto art exhibition? Well, the ghetto art exhibition was decided. Um, uh, and I, and I, I must say there's this cultural um, wave of, of ac ac activities, mostly at night, because the days that people were working. Um, was uh, not not easily accepted by everybody. There was a, for instance, Hermann Krug, who was a an important historian who wrote the 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 diary of the ghetto, whom I remember very well from the Strashun Library, sitting there behind it, kind of a dirty uh, glass door, uh, writing some things uh, whenever I came to the. To change a book in the in the library, uh, he thought it was it was that you do not you do not uh, uh, sing songs uh, uh, on uh, on on the grounds of a cemetery. He considered the ghetto a big cemetery, and he was not very happy about it. And later he changed a little his uh, his opinion. It's possible. 
but he also wrote somehow that this was the only thing worthwhile to see on this exhibition later <laughs> in his diary. Uh, the, you know that usually professional actors are not happy to act with children because it is always the children that steal the show. And I must say that there's several um, painters of the ghetto were not very happy to exhibit with me. I had there over 20 paintings chosen while they had one or two. And, um, and there was a certain jealousy for all the space that was dedicated to me and so on. But I uh, kind of uh, put it aside as experience that I, I would elaborate later in life, uh, learning what it is, professional jealousy and 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 uh, the jealousy about from other colleagues about my personal success and so on, which are normal things of life. <laughs> they are not related to the Holocaust. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Uh, I also came upon your watercolors that Sitzkever donated to YIVO, yeah. which you uh, visited at YIVO in New York in 1987. So now yeah. we'll move on to the ghetto. And when I had asked you for an image of the ghetto, uh, you had provided me um, one that is very, very, very moving. Um, it, is, it is this one here. So I wanted to ask you about the ghetto. Um, you escaped from the ghetto twice. And uh, in the next image, in the, on the next slide, we have a self-portrait of you. Can you tell us about the significance of the burlap sack in this self-portrait? We'll speak more intensive, uh, extensively about the Warsaw Ghetto Boy later in the talk, but I would like for you to address your escapes and the significance of the sack. Maybe if we go uh, back a moment to the former painting that you were showing, because, uh, no, the, uh, the former one, the ghetto, yeah. This painting, uh, this painting I painted in New York in 76, and I tried to express through it my the sense that I had and all the people had of being buried in a hole. You you have the ghetto described as a hole in the ground. It's already almost like a site of burying people, while the world outside is of total indifference. All the things are kind of geometrically square. Um, they, for me, represented indifference. I must say that this very large painting, which is much taller than than my 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 size, uh, ended up in the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston, and it was uh, it it was displayed in the rotunda of the museum. And the docents of the museum were telling me that they were desperate, thinking that after six months of being displayed in this place of honor, it will be taken off. And, and, and they were bringing all the people that they were visiting the museum to see this painting and speak of, of, of Vilnius or Vilnius. So it, it's an important painting in my life. Now, if you go to the, the to the the one that you um, were showing here, yes, I painted. I tried to paint a kind of a self portrait of myself at the age in which I was part of the children that are depicted here in uh, various forms of the cutout silhouette of the of the Warsaw boy. And I depicted myself here in a sack because it was in a sack that my father uh, smuggled me out from the labor camp uh, in a sack that was supposed to be packed with wood. And it is this, this sack that allowed me to survive. When my father put me into the sack, it was the last time I saw him alive. I then heard when the sack was opened and I was put out from a window and told to run, I don't even remember if this was the voice of my father or not. 
um, but what I what I know is that the sack was very itchy and um, and I still felt it when I heard on my skin when I heard run run and then somebody was waiting for me to pick me up. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Now you write that the Landsberg DP camp, write that the Landsberg DP camp was like a shuttle with survivors speaking a great deal about their experiences, even if later on they ended up clamming up. Most of your surviving early works, aside from the pinkest and from the watercolors, were rendered in the DP camp. Your works there, even as a child, attest to your own Holocaust experience. However, Holocaust themes didn't return to your work until the 1960s. Was this a similar phenomenon as what you'd mentioned regarding the DP camp survivors, or was it potentially triggered by your mother's death, or why did you end up returning to Holocaust themes? Well, um, that is not uh, an, easy, an easy question to answer because it is, it is extremely complex. I mean, I have uh, uh, had not only a frightening memory of my own uh, survival as a, as a child of 10, but then when I ended up in a camp of displaced persons, I was surrounded by people who did not stop speaking of what has happened to them. Uh, unlike what happened to all these people who, once they arrived to the United States or to other countries or to Israel, and they wanted to be so-called normal people, mainly have children and show their children that they have normal parents, they shut up. They shut up also uh, for the people who, who, who embraced them when they came because there was no common denominator of language. There were no words to speak of what has happened. While in the camp, everybody knew what every word meant. When you, when you uh, say it to organize, it meant to steal. Uh, uh, I don't want to go into all the problems of the of what was life in the camp because this is a subject per uh, per se. But I ended up in Israel, living in a small community of friends of my family that were all survivors. So we lived with the Holocaust as a, as a kind of a present entity in our life. We lived actually with ghosts. And there was not one day that we could uh, ignore them. All these people who were not there with us at the table. Um, when I moved to Paris to continue my studies and so on, of course, I, I, I very much wanted to be part of what you call normalcy and uh, exploit the possibilities of modern art, the possibilities of having a career and so on. And for a good number of years, my work got a little further. But at the same time, like every artist, there is, there is a kind of a rule uh, that says, know yourself, which is not only for artists, right? It's right for every human being, <laughs> know yourself. If you know yourself, you will be more comfortable in your skin, you will be more comfortable with other people and so on. So the, 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 the know yourself brought me to realize that beyond the many possibilities that I had and the many shapes that I could give to my art, I had a specific story, but I also felt a, a, a specific, uh, a specific kind of, uh, um, need, which would help me also to integrate the, the things that I have lived by speaking about it, by touching it, by making more and more and more explicit things that relate to that. At the same time, suddenly, I feared that the over-graphic work, the too explicit things, 
instead of bringing people closer to the history, can push them away. So I have decided to treat it in a very enigmatic kind, in a symbolic kind, metaphoric kind of language. I tried to use sometimes a kind of a black humor that very often exists in my work. And, uh, and finally, uh, the years uh, that helped me to be reinforced by my artistic decisions in which I was able to experience how, how it worked, how people reacted, how, how, how it really helped to tell the story. And, and I mu must say that for me, Lithuania and my relation to Lithuania was especially important because here were, was a generation of Lithuanians from whom the Soviets have completely obfuscated the history of their place. They had no idea of what has happened there. Suddenly, everything had to be told from, <laughs> from the beginning, a filling in of a whole empty space. And, and seeing my work so helpful in that direction, gave me it gave me a, 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 a feeling of fulfillment that I, I cannot even describe, something really important, because then suddenly art is not something that goes to the homes and the more successful uh, you are, to the whole homes of the richer and richer people who have more and more rooms to exp uh, expose art, but it went to the museums, it went to to schools, it, it went to the, uh, uh, the Facing History organization that was teaching teachers to teach the Holocaust. So, so somehow it all worked out in a way that I can today, um, in my 90th year, look with a certain sense of, um, of, I, of having achieved something. You certainly have, Mr. Bach. Now, themes of the lost childhood and absence resonate in your work. In the teddy bears and portrayals of trains as toy trains, and here in the reader, I see this work as a reference to your grandparents, to the afternoons of make-believe ships, sails, and horses that you spent at your grandparents. Can you speak to the themes of childhood and absence? Well, you know, <laughs> The, 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 the stories of, uh, of paintings and why they happen and how they happen um, is, 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 is very complex. And very often um, I'm really even surprised when I see them and I see that they, uh, that they are still saying something. Well, here, I, I want to say something that about myself when I was age six and seven, five, six, seven, I used to spend afternoons with uh, one of my grandmothers. I loved their living room. It had this furniture with the heads of lions and all kinds of things. And, but I loved the idea of boats. I, I loved their sofa, which you, what you could undo and make a boat of it. But I told my grandmother, but this is not very much of a sea, this uh, parquet of yours. What we need here is for you to bring me some water and spill on it, spill on it, and then it will become, it will become uh, a sea for me. And when I painted this painting, I um, I painted this painting, this man reading, reading in a boat. He is in a world that was completely dismembered, but it is in a world with the, where there are real clouds and artificial clouds, where the whales of the boat are torn. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a history of, a, of a, a absurd, but it is also maybe the absurd theater of UNESCO, the only one who can, in a very realistic way, display all the contradictions of the 20th century. Thank you, yes. The 
the moments in your book that were just so wondrous and joyful. They're they're incredibly captivating to read. Now, occasionally Christian symbols and influences pop up in your work, which can be confusing and surprising to viewers. Can you tell us both about both of your instances of hiding in the convent and also about Sister Maria? Oh yes, uh, uh, definitely. I, uh, I, 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 I must confess that uh, I'm not a religious person. I am what, I define myself as a God-fearing atheist. I am an atheist and I am God-fearing because I am afraid what in the name of various gods and various ideologies people can do to other people. So how comes I painted this painting? Well, I must, I must tell you that in the convent in which I was before I went to the ghetto, uh, I was seven years of age. I was very impressed, first of all, by the beauty of the nuns, by their, by their attire, by their extraordinary uh, elegance of those black robes moving around. But I was also very much impressed by the books that they gave me to read, all very Catholic books. And... And also the idea that there was a world uh, in which we will go after, if we die, and a wonderful world where we will sing for Christ. I was, I was very happy knowing that there is actually no danger. It's only you pass from one world to another world. And I became a very good Catholic. And I had somehow even this feeling of the Catholic when I arrived to the ghetto, I had a small picture of Christ in my pocket, of course, hiding it from my friends because they would have beaten me up if they had known that I have a picture of Christ in my pocket. But then when we were liberated by the Russians in 44, the war was not yet finished. We were liberated in June, July, and the, the war finished only in May of next year. For some time, I used uh, secretly go to churches. I love the churches because they had this beautiful smell and the ring of the bells, and the boys in those white gowns and so on. But they also had some horrible pictures of, of, of suffering people hanging on the walls, very dark pictures with people being crucified, with people being tortured on wheels, with people having um, their intestines taken out from uh, their bodies. I mean, it was frightening. But then little by little, the everyday life uh, took away from me an interest for Catholicism. And in the DP camp, when I arrived to the age of 13, and my mother thought that it would be good that I prepare for a bar mitzvah, I said, a bar mitzvah? Never. I will never, ever celebrate a bar mitzvah unless... God, our Jewish God Almighty, comes here and on his knees demands an excuse for what he has permitted to happen to my best friend Samek, to my father, to my grandparents, to uncles, aunts, to our entire nation. At age 13, I knew the number was six million. I knew it. And, and I must say that I came to Vilnius a couple of times when my grandsons had 13, instead of celebrating their 13th uh, age in a synagogue, I took them to Vilnius and to each one of them, I told the story of the family. And I must uh, add here a little detail with Tom, my second grandson, he was 13. We were in the in a hotel in Vilnius. 
I came on a very private visit. I was just for, it was just for the boy. And then I had a telephone call at eight o'clock. Please be so kind and come to the office of the prime minister. He wants to talk to you. And that is when I heard that there is a plan for uh, accepting all my works and making a museum and a learning institution uh, uh, from my art. And um, I said, I can only come if I can uh, go with my grandson. So I went with my grandson and when we came out, my grandson said, Grandpa, what did you do? How can I tell my, 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 my friends that I was in the office of a prime minister? They will never believe me. Well, things happen. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Um, we've now moved to the Warsaw boy. You focused on the Warsaw boy in a great deal of your works. I think you said three, yeah. three or 400. However, you've placed him into a variety of contexts. Sometimes he's faceless, on other occasions he has your features. Sometimes he refers to your friend Samik and you often render the boy with bullet holes in his palms, reminiscent of the imagery of Jesus Christ in the stigmata. Can you explain how you see the Warsaw boy as a sort of Jewish crucifixion and what the reference is to your friend Samik? Oh, it is, uh, I mean, my, my friend Samik was, I must say he was my best friend because it so happens that sometimes the best friends happen best friends because of strange circumstances. When my mother was seven years um, old, uh, she went to school on the first day. There was a little girl that came to her. Her name, she introduced herself to my mother. She said, my name is Manya. Would you like to be uh, my best friend and my mother said well I will try you and they became friends and they became friends and my mother and her friend Manya were pregnant at the same time I was maybe born a couple of days before the other boy was born I was given the name Samek the other boy was given Samek and since childhood we were brought up as best friend as almost uh, twins and uh, while we found our hiding in uh, the convent, his uh, parents uh, found a way of leaving Samek uh, with his nanny. But somebody of the neighbors of that house who saw that there was a boy in the house of that woman and the boy was probably Jewish, denounced it to the uh, police. Uh, the police or SS, I, I don't know who it was, came, gunned him down uh, on the stairs where he lived and left his body covered in blood there for uh, 24 hours, telling that no one should uh, touch this body. And everybody in the building had to see this dead boy, knowing what will happen to them if ever they give uh, refuge to a, a Jewish uh, child. So uh, this Samek, memory of myself and the boy of the Warsaw Ghetto, we are, we are kind of a reunited <laughs> a trio. I certainly do not see myself as a victim I see myself just the opposite of it, but I can speak about it. I can speak about it and I, I feel a, a, an enormous uh, sense of, of obligation at the same time, amazing gratefulness that I can do it and speak of what has happened to men and explain to to other generation of young people with the hope that by learning all that, they will never allow such horrors to happen. Uh, it's not a very, I, I, I'm not a naive person. I, I know that neo-Nazis are even to be found in Boston. You don't have to go very far for them, but um, 
I still believe in the power of, of education. Thank you. So in 2001, you returned to Vilnius after 56 years. And in, as in your words, you've returned subsequently several times. I would like to read you a quote from Viktor Spachmetyevas, a non-Jewish Lithuanian philosopher and a speaker in the April session of our series who wished to pass on his admiration. Viktor S. wrote, I had the privilege of being the advisor to the Minister of Culture at the time of the opening of the Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius. It was an extremely moving occasion for so many reasons. Of course, first is the life story of Bach the painter. Hearing about the boy who started painting in the ghetto, whose first exhibition was in the ghetto, reminds us that even in these horrible, unspeakable conditions, human spirit prevails. Jews in the Vilna ghetto organized a theater, held concerts, continued learning. This is simply inspiring. And second is the fact that Bach has come back to Vilnius, both physically, but also with his work. For me, it is extremely moving. It is a triumph of perseverance, of creativity, and of the human spirit. Now, Mr. Bach, you have spoken a bit about your return to Vilnius. Can you tell us about whether you had any hesitations in 2001 and also how you ended up choosing the specific works that you donated? Uh... Well, um, I must say that um, for many years, I felt that going back to Vilnius would be something that um, I could not undertake. It was beyond beyond my 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 power to deal with 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 such an emotional such an emotional uh, experience. But then uh, someone called Rimanta Stankevicius, uh, a Lithuanian who worked for the Lithuanian parliament and was doing a research on people who saved Jews, like Father Stakauskas, Gemaitis, and Sister Maria Mikulska, um, came to visit me uh, here in Weston, in this house from which I'm now speaking to you. And he was very, he was very kind, very impressive, I must say. And we became now uh, the best friends. We are now like brothers, I must say. We, I just said, if, uh, I told him a few days ago, goodbye, he returned to Vilnius. He came to Boston, especially for the opening of my exhibition. Uh, he wrote about about the people who helped uh, uh, to save Jews. And I must say, that subject has always interested me enormously. This extraordinary altruism. When I think about it, when I think of the people who uh, put their own life in jeopardy, who risk their lives for saving others, would I myself be as courageous as they? I don't even find the answer in me because I, I, I don't know how I would react in, 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 in conditions of such extreme violence. But I am so grateful to them for what they did. For me, they are saints. And these were people about whom Rimantas has written a wonderful book. Um, I just read it a few days ago in German. It was translated into German, especially for me, because my Lithuanian is not existing. Um, I, uh, I must say that my first visit to Vilnius was, a, was a something that was related already to an invitation of Emanuele Zingiris, um, from Vilnius, from the Vilnius Parliament, and he was then the director, I think, of the museum to come. But I told in secret to Rimantas, before I come to Vilnius, I must come with my wife on a very private, secret visit. I must see how I feel in the streets of Vilnius. So we made my exhibition was supposed to be in September. In May, we made a special trip for this kind of private exploration of Vilnius. 
And when we arrived, the people were asked in the plane to wait for some important people that have to descend. We didn't know who those important people were. And then we were told it was us. And then we came down from the plane and there was Rimantas and there was Zingiris and there were people with flowers and there were uh, journalists and people of television and so on and so forth. And suddenly it was a fact. There was, there was nothing, <laughs> no private exploration yet, yet. Next morning in the hotel, after we had a good sleep, uh, uh, it was a tiring trip to get there. I told, I told um, my wife, look, you re please remain in the hotel, have a good sleep. I will go out and make a little exploration. And we were in a hotel very next, uh, next to the big tower of the university. And I started to walk through the streets and besides the colors of the buildings that changed, and some of them were repaired. The places were so known to me. They were so familiar. They were, everything was exactly the way I remembered. I imagined it would be very different. No, it was exactly the way I remembered, precisely. The only thing that changed was the language spoken in the streets. Instead of Polish and uh, Yiddish, it was Lithuanian. But for the rest, I, I returned to the hotel, I, 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 I felt that it was really an extraordinary page that turned in my life. The kind of acceptance of the privilege of having been born in a place where I can define myself when they ask me, so what is your identity? I answer always in Yiddish, I say, Ich bin a Vilner like uh, uh, President Kennedy, who grew up in Berlin uh, when he was in, 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 in Germany, President Kennedy told the people in Berlin, Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, so I can say Ich bin ein Wilner in Yiddish. Yes, the, the city is anchored in me in a very, very, very profound way. I feel that it has been an extraordinary privilege to carry in me some remains of its culture, some vision of the world, and some of the ethics that really distinguish the, the Jews of Vilnius. Thank you. Collective memory is constantly shifting. Can you speak to the place of art in shaping collective memory? Well, you know, I'm, I was thinking, uh, looking at this painting here of, um, of uh, the greatest illustrator of all times, Michelangelo. <laughs> he, he, with his paintings, was telling, like many other artists who were employed by the church, were telling stories to illiterate people um, in all the cultures. There are artists who visually tell stories to illiterate people. Now, we live in a time in which there is a very different kind of illiteracy. People know more and more about less and less. And the less is exactly the thing which you call collective memory. What is it that happened before our time? What is it that shaped the various canons of what is right, what is, what is wrong, what are the, I don't know, the uh, frontiers of a country? It has to do with collective memory. There is hardly anything of the human experience that is not part of the collective memory. And also questioning even the collective memory, which is very often, uh, created not only by facts, but also by interests of in stories that invent facts in order to get to some point. So history is, I think, the most interesting 
subject. History for me is collective memory. Collective memory is history. But you as, as historians must know that history is never the same. It, is, it remakes itself continuously according to the experiences that, that, that furnish our, our existence. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Now we'll move on to the Q&A. Now, our first question comes from Julian Schmidt, who I will credit with these beautiful slides. Julian is a friend and a fellow student, and he's actually of German origin. So Julian asks, when you view your early work, what surprises you the most? When you see through the eyes of the celebrated artists that you have become today, what surprises you in your early pieces? Uh, what what surprises me when I see my really very early work, my work until age uh, to, uh, 13, 14, um, what surprises me is this incredible talent that I have that I don't even know, I, I, I didn't even know how I, I managed to make these things. I mean, these are the only things that really impress me in my work. Are, are are the ones that 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 express this enormous talent that I don't know where it came from. Later on, I know uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of learning, a lot of of effort, a lot of. Um, but my um, my mother somehow had this attitude, saying. Never think of yourself as a genius, even if you hear people saying it. Every Jewish child is a genius of, of some kind. She uh, says the worst thing that happens to geniuses is that they become pompous asses. So uh, um, I, uh, I mean, I am, I am who I am. I am the, the celebrated artist has no uh, right to enter my address of 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 uh, of uh, Weston, where I live. I mean, I live it outside of my house, but uh, I am always incredibly grateful and, 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 and I think incredibly amazed at the, in some way, good deeds that I could do, uh, in spite of the fact that I have spent my whole life doing the thing that I love, which is painting. And you know what Mark Twain said? He said, if you love what you are doing, you won't work a single day in your life. That is very inspiring. Um, my next question, and which will be the last question, is other children who grew up or were born in DP camps have said that they never shook the feeling of displacement throughout their lives. Do you feel that you ever developed a sense of home? I don't know. I use very much the, 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 the answer where my roots are to say, my roots are always in my suitcase. Uh, I have lived, uh, I mean, I was in, 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 in Poland uh, uh, in one reality uh, that existed before, before the war in a different reality after that. And I lived in, 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 in Germany and then in Israel. I lived in France, I lived in Switzerland, I lived in Italy for many years. Now since 30 years, I live here. Where I my roots, where is my home? I, it is also something very liberating not to have roots stuck in some place, you are much more free. I mean, we, after all, we aspire for freedom and uh, freedom is such an important thing. So why not have one's roots in a suitcase? I mean, um, I don't know. I, 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 I must say that the people who uh, entered this a uh, very polarizing experience of the Holocaust. The very different people from very different parts of the society with very different characters. The children that went through it were different personalities. 
also surrounded by different people. So today, unfortunately, there is, and I have encountered it more and more, the attitude of the survivor. What the survivor says, what the survivor feels, what is common to the survivors. The story is much more complex, is much more complex. And fortunately, it will nourish, it will nourish many writings and many researches as time goes on. Because it, it does not mean that all the expression and the viewpoints of people who have survived or they have survived have been the same for the same people throughout their lives. They have also changed. There, I mean, uh, we must remember, remember one thing, memory is not a folder that you bring down on your computer and it is always the same. Memory is a recreation. And it is always a recreation of something that happens in other circumstances. So documents, yes, documents come down the same. But oral history, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> it's a very complex, it's a very complex uh, sphere. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again, Mr. Samuel Bach, for the incredible conversation today. Thank you thank also you. for your eternal contribution as an artist and as a storyteller. You are an incomparable storyteller. You're a gift to the world of art, memoir, and to Holocaust testimony, enlivening the stories for us budding Holocaust scholars. Thank you also to my friend and fellow student, Julian Schmidt, who made these beautiful slides. And thank you again to the Emil and Jenny Fish Center for valuing Holocaust education and to Vilnius University for the partnership and the many opportunities that it has given to our students. Thank you to Dr. Pilnick, to Brittany Hager and Hodiah Blau. And thank you again to the Rumsheskis Markettown Museum Corporation, which will facilitate for me to go see the Pinkus next week. Uh, please join us again for our last session on June 4th with Dr. Justin Cami, the translator and editor of Abraham Sutzkever's memoir on the Vilna Ghetto, which will also delve into the Young Vilna Yiddishist movement. Our prior sessions are on the Fish Center's YouTube channel, and the April session discusses the publication of Jewish books in Lithuanian, with Sutzkever's memoir coming soon in Lithuanian. Thank you again to all of you for joining us today, and have a delightful rest of your Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.